Hey everyone, this is Matt Waldman with the Rookie Scouting Portfolio. Um, this is a video tour of the Rookie Scouting Portfolio post-draft analysis. The RSP comes in two publications. There's a pre-draft that I make available for download April 1st, and this is something that you can download anytime now through the end of the year at 1995. And then what comes with it is a post-draft analysis that is available a week after the NFL draft and this is what we're going to be looking at today this is all part of the RSP package um, fantasy owners love this particular aspect of the RSP they often tell me that they would pay 1995 for this and the pre-draft that comes out April 1st um, I make it all available in one package for 1995 um, the RSP post draft is a much smaller document. Um, it's a PDF document, very much like the pre draft. Um, it's, this one is the 13, 2013 post draft, and it's 67 pages in length. It's bookmarked the same way as the pre draft. You go to the upper left hand corner of the Adobe document and find the, the blue ribbon. You click on that, and then you have this particular. Um, bookmark that you can expand by clicking on it and you're going to see a variety of chapters to take a look at. So I'm going to explain what you can use this post draft for, give you some um, specific examples and then you know you should be able to you know use it pretty well for your fantasy drafts both dynasty league and even redraft leagues this is going to have value for you. So the first thing that we do is Let's take a look at, you know, I have a section on how to use the, the pre and post draft together, what my dynasty and redraft league philosophies are. I give you some articles from my blog that I think fit well within this post draft um, strategy scenario that, that this package um, represents. And I talk about overrated and underrated players. Um, you'll see that Eddie Lacy's listed here as overrated. As you get as we get into this, you'll see that he was very slightly overrated. He was my number one pre draft running back and post draft he just dropped somewhat due to injury in the presence of Jonathan Franklin and his draft status um, but he was still a top 10 pick in my eyes in this particular dynasty league draft and that meant that he still had values of fantasy back for redraft leagues as well Then I talk about players that I think fit well based on where they were picked in the NFL draft guys like Matt Barkley you know, Zach Ertz, these were two players I didn't have rated very high in the, in the pre-draft publication, but I gave them good, good marks as far, as far as being good fits within their offense. And if you look at Chip Kelly's offense and see that Nick Foles was a Pro Bowl player, and I wasn't a huge fan of Nick Foles. I think he's an okay player, but I think that the offense was very helpful to him. And while he played well enough, and obviously he played well enough to get into a Pro Bowl, um, I don't think that he's their long-term solution. And I think that Matt Barkley was a good example of a player that if he had performed well in camp, probably would have had not, you know, bigger opportunity to, to climb up that depth chart. So I looked at him as a good possible fit. And I give explanations like that for these players. Um, I have good fits and bad fits. And I have players that are undrafted free agents to watch. Derek Rogers, Ken Brell Tompkins, Ryan Griffin, um, CJ Anderson are among some of the players that I had as good fits. Long-term dynasty waiver wire gems. You know, these are guys that in two to three years I think might have a chance to develop into either reserves or contributors, maybe even starters. Long-term projects, guys that may be stuck behind a, a very well, you know, very very productive starter, um, but may have a chance to be able to be traded or developed on the line and be traded by an, to another team because of their skills. Marlon Brown, for me, was an example of that. He was with the Texans early on, but ended up with the Ravens and became a, a very good contributor for them as a rookie early on. Ryan Griffin developed pretty quick. You've got Perez Ashford with Seattle now. Charles Johnson is with the Cleveland Browns. Um, these are guys to watch in dynasty leagues over that short, that longer term um, you know, trajectory of a player's career. So then I talk about rankings. Um, I give you some cheat sheets and kind of a strategic overview into the drafts, as well as um, rankings and commentary. And to, let's start with the strategic overview. I give you an idea of which positions I think are going to have a lot of movement, which positions may be better for the later rounds, which where the trade market is um, going to be helpful to you, and which position is deep. So I give you kind of an, an idea to take an how to take this and formulate an overall strategy that's going to help you. Then let's get into 
the the tiered cheat sheet. This is probably the favorite of fantasy owners um, because what I do with it is I rank every player or every position together rather than separate rankings by a position it's going to be all grouped together and it's going to be done in tiers which is very easy for fantasy owners and I give you some shorthand information that's quite valuable so that you can determine when you need to make trades either trading up into a round or trade back um, where the depth flies um, as well as using this for redraft leagues to understand which guys are, are good to draft, which guys are good to keep on a waiver wire, even for dynasty leagues, which guys you should draft early, but at the same time, here are some players that have value that in June, July, August, you should be keeping an eye on in camp so that you know when to pounce on your waiver wire as the situation changes because that's the whole thing with fantasy football. It's being fluid with the situation, being able to react. So I have tiers. These tiers are color-coded. These are players that I think are going to you know, I, I have them, even, and I even put the rankings there. So that my first 14 players in this draft, I said, were guys that are going to see the field early and develop into productive players. These are the guy. These guys in in blue and in green are the players that I probably would recommend for redraft owners to keep an eye on for the mid to late rounds of fantasy drafts. Whereas for dynasty leagues, these are the premium picks for the rookie drafts. Tier C, the red tier, is guys that I think are possible contributors they're probably on a crowded depth chart right now or they have talent to do something for you as a fantasy owner in certain situations maybe they'll be a red zone threat maybe they'll be a guy that's used in multiple receiver sets maybe he's a committee back and used as a as a you know he has point per per reception value as a third down back tier d is guys that i think are worth stashing long term maybe you know, they're a developmental talent or a reserve on a team right now in two to three years. Maybe they get a shot as a starter. And then the bottom tier are guys that I think are only for larger leagues, and they're guys that you would put have on your waiver wire right now. And, you know, maybe if they show something, you can pick them up later. So I would say tier C through E are probably guys that they're at the bottom of your depth chart, um, in your fantasy roster, depending on how large your roster is, or they're maybe on your practice squad or waiver wire. Um, so I talk about that, and then I have types that are noted next to each player. Are they underrated? You know, are they players with a high risk reward, boom bust type of player? Are they a sleeper? Um, are they a guy that maybe has a specific talent as a pass catcher um, in the red zone, or maybe a blocker only, or maybe they're a guy that does really well out of the backfield as a receiver, but maybe they have limited upside because they're only going to be used in a, in a specific, highly specific way and team fit's going to matter a lot. Do they have high ceiling, but they have a lot of things that they need to work on? Derek Rogers would be a good, good example of a player with a high ceiling but needs a lot of work, or are they an injury concern? Then I have value designations. I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail later, but it's basically taking a look at my post-draft ranking of the player, weighing it against the average draft position that I have um, researched for these players in dynasty leagues and coming up with a number that either puts them plus at par, which is within plus or minus five picks um, of where their value is, or over or under. And so you're going to see that in a little bit more detail in a minute. I'll explain that. So the first thing that you're going to see is this, is this um, value chart. And this is what it looked like last year. You can see that I have number, which is what, what number ranked player he is overall. At EJ Manuel is the number 15th ranked player overall for Dynasty League drafts in May. I had him in the blue tier, meaning that I think he would develop early and see the field early as a productive player. And he had flashes of production until he got hurt. Um, I saw as a guy that had high ceiling but needs work, and that his value was at was under 13, which meant that based on my ranking of him, he was getting picked 13 spots lower than my ranking, which meant that you could wait on him. He might I had him ranked 15, but you could probably wait on him till as the number 28th pick overall and feel like that you were still getting, um, you know, you're going to be able to get good value out of him as a player. Um, so you can see, you know, other players are examples of this. Eddie Lacy. He was ranked number nine on my list 
in the post draft. I had him number one in the pre draft, but I dropped him, like I said, due to the, the variety of factors that happened in the NFL draft. I had him as an injury concern due to the toe. I had him overrated by 0.7, which basically means he was pretty close to being on par with where he should be picked. He was a top 10 pick in dynasty leagues. He was somebody that, um, to me, wasn't, you know, maybe he was less than one pick overvalued. Um, to where he was actually going. So to me, he, he was a worthwhile pick in this range. I'm just getting very technical for you so that you can see transparency-wise how my my um, formulas worked. Another example of a guy who might, you know, I looked at as underrated, Marcus Wilson, 19th overall on my list, but you could probably get him 23.4 picks later than number 19 overall and get good value out of him. I think that you can see the fantasy community really likes Marcus Wilson and his promise with that Bears offense on the line due to the fact that Brandon Marshall is probably going to be gone in you know two to three years. So that gives you an example. I rate all these players. You see all the tiers. The blue and the green tiers are probably good for fantasy owners and redraft leagues because you can see, you know, most of these players. Zach Stacy is a good example. Here's a guy that in that green tier, you know, green tier again is short-term depth obstacle, starter talent, or contributor talent with immediate fit. Well, to me, he was a starter talent on a crowded off depth chart and it was a short-term obstacle for him, and it played out that way. Midway through the season, he became the starter, and he became the bell cow for the Rams offense, and I had him rated as the 16th overall player, I meaning you can get him either the bottom of the first round or the early second round, and that his value in drafts early on at that point, the average value was on par with my ranking, meaning that if you want to take Zach Stacy, you need to take him – within five picks of 16 plus or minus. So either earliest at number 11 overall or latest at 21 overall. Um, Monty Ball, I had him as number 18th overall. I felt like he's a specific talent with limited upside. I thought he was overrated by seven picks, meaning that most likely you were going to have to take him 10th or 11th overall, but I had him rated at 18th overall. So if you want to take him, you probably had to take him early. If you had a spot at 10th overall and didn't like Monty Ball and you wanted to trade back, then you could see that he, you felt like he was overrated. This might be a good opportunity for you to trade back with him. That's where this works pretty well for you. Then you can see these numbers that say WW and then a 4 with it, a notation WW4. That means this is a player that I think is a waiver wire option. Um, and then I get the priority of where I think he, he should land. Spencer Ware I really liked. I had him rated high in the RSP pre-draft. Uh, a, a foot injury derailed his season, but you can tell that Pete Carroll used him enough early on in the preseason and even in the first game of the season that he was going to see the field. And he was going to be a fullback, running back tweener, and kind of the way that Jason Snelling was, maybe even work his way into the depth chart a little bit. Um, very good receiver out of the backfield. He was a guy to watch. The guy that worked out that way was Ken Kenbrell Tompkins. I had him rated as a sleeper. I had him rated as a guy that, you know, tier C, contributed potential, crowded depth chart, situational talent with good immediate fit. I had him as a sleeper. He was my second priority guy on waiver wires in May. So in August, by August, you know, he was a hot property because they, he ended up being the starter early in the season and had some fantasy production for you. And he's still worthwhile, you know, probably keeping an eye on and looking at. So you can see that I have like over, you know, close to 50 players rated on waiver wire potential. And you can see that it's, it's a good fit for you because you can look and say he may be Matt Waldman's 38th ranked player overall. But Matt's saying he's really no more than a waiver wire pick for you. Um, so don't waste your time picking him right at this point, maybe, you know, unless you're in a deeper league. But he's probably one of the top five players you want to keep an eye on this summer because if things work out well for him, he plays well, he gets opportunities, and then he earns a starting job, which he did, you're going to want to take him. So it's probably good to pounce on him in July or August when you start hearing that good news based on my ranking and based on that news. That's how this chart is going to help you um, because it gives you my view of them. It also gives you the realistic view of what NFL or what fantasy owners are doing with the draft with this value chart and ranking and kind of playing these two off of each other so that you know how to make a move on them. Um, if you want to see further explanations about these players, 
then I give you an overall ranking just like that that tier cheat sheet but now it's just more in that table format that I used in the pre-draft it's color coded again to give you an idea of you know again how I view them and you get the competition that they have on their depth chart and notes about that competition as well as just my commentary based on where I've ranked them in the draft and the colors change of course just like they did before you know Zach Stacy in that that green tier now you know um, you can get down you go down a little further Kenny Stills is in that tier as a situational guy that I thought had a nice opportunity to develop and he was my number 13th receiver on this board um, but I listed him as a guy who has a nice chance to become a deep threat for the Saints you know because Drew, Drew Brees is a great play action passer and the, and the deep speed that matches with that and the fact that he can play all three receiver spots and I think he's a prospect with potential to contribute this year you know there you go so that's the information for this the way that, that the, the draft position information is developed um, the, the value data is that I take a worksheet like this and this is me showing my math again you don't need to look at this if you don't want to but I look at um, dynasty league drafts that happen between now and when I create the post draft RSP these are heavy duty dynasty leagues um, pretty you know hardcore players and I take a look at where each player is getting drafted what spot they're being drafted Giovanni Bernard for instance in one draft was the fourth overall player picked and these other ones it was first fourth second and you see all that I also take an ADP um, average draft position look from my fantasy league because I think that it's a, a reputable site to be able to look at dynasty leagues with and I take all that together I create an average draft position I give you the number of drafts that I looked at where the high pick was where the low pick was and then I take his raw value um, and that raw value or, or I take the value here and the value is Giovanni Bernard was my number one ranked post draft RSP player the average draft position was um, 2.1 so one, you know, basically what you're looking at is that he was, my ranking of him was 1.1 lower or 1.1 higher than the average draft position at 2.1. So his raw value was minus 1.1 and his value is par, meaning that he was within plus or minus five picks. My ranking of him is within plus or minus five picks of where dynasty owners are drafting him. So that means you need to take him basically where his ADP is. Um, if it's over Eddie Lacy, I had him listed as overrated, but it was slight because I had him ranked ninth in my post draft due to what happened with the NFL draft. But fantasy owners were still ranking him as one of the as the 3.3 pick overall. So nine minus 3.3 was 5.7. So I had him overrated um, at you know. 5.7 picks well because I use par as plus or minus 5 that adjusted number is, comes out to 0.7 he was 0.7 overrated meaning that he's basically on par you need to take him where people are drafting him you know another example would be a guy like let's look at uh, Kenny Stills again Kenny Stills was my 24th ranked player overall his average draft position in this particular look was 34 so then that meant that he was 10.1 you know I had him rated 10.1 picks higher than where he was going um, and then when I take a look at the you know when I do the adjustment with plus or minus 5 he was actually underrated by 15.1 and that made him a nice value meaning that you could wait probably another 15 picks based on my ranking of him in this cheat sheet you know you look at this again to give you an explanation where is Kenny Stills here you know I had him 24th ranked under ranked by 15.1 so basically you could wait till pick 39 or within plus or minus five picks of pick 39 to take Kenny Stills and still get good value from him no one was probably going to pick him until that point so you don't have to draft him at 24 even though I have him ranked at 24 you could pick him somewhere in the mid 30 range and end up still getting him and and get that future starter so that's how that all works 
you know it's it's pretty it's pretty easy to navigate you you've got your you've got your overall cheat sheets you've got your explanations for how the cheat sheets work you kind of have my strategic impact of you know how this draft class is shaken out um, and then you can use this in two ways you have the you have this for fantasy owners for redraft and dynasty leagues and you can make these picks you know kind of help you plan your moves but then two to three years from now if say for instance you know Tyler Wilson ends up getting a chance to start for the Tennessee Titans well or it looks like he's looking good in camp you can look at my pre-draft analysis read about that and that's devoid of any type of in you know any type of influence of what the media views Tyler Wilson to be based on the fact that he got cut by the Raiders and didn't work out well in Oakland now that's information that's worthwhile to you but sometimes you want to be able to look at kind of the more innocent look of saying what did the what did he look like in college what made him a a player that you know that Matt Waldman wanted to rank him so high and you know maybe he maybe he was right about Tyler Wilson in some regard now I don't know if that's going to be the case but that that's the type of thing that happens Troy Bell is a great example of a player I ranked in the mid you know in the top 10 of a lot of my I think in my pre-draft publication but he bounced around the league with three or four teams before he ended up with Detroit um, you know if you were going to look at his post-draft value you would have said oh he's probably not ever going to do anything but if you looked at my pre-draft analysis you would you would look at that and say this is a guy I need to keep an eye on because he has talent and he may just need a good fit um, to be able to thrive and that's exactly what happened and a lot of players end up in those types of situations so that's why you want to be able to use still keep an eye on the pre-draft why people say it has three to four years of value sometimes more and then the post draft gives you kind of that more immediate business look of the of the draft and where players were ranked and what their draft stock means in terms of opportunities so again you can get this at mattwaldman.com and you can download this um, a week after the draft I will send you an email um, letting you know when it's ready when you purchase the RSP um, meantime enjoy the the pre-draft publication um, you can look at you know, you can go to my website, mattwaldmanrsp.com, to see a video tour of the pre-draft publication if you haven't caught it. And again, 10% of each sale of this package, the pre-draft, post-draft RSP, which is all 19.95 for, you know, over 1,300 pages of material. This 10% of this goes to Darkness to Light, which is an organization that is designed to prevent sexual abuse through training communities. Penn State has done some work with them recently. The Citadel has has um, provided training to all of its teachers and faculty and um, you see this the type of training that they put out is also for communities, civic organizations, fire departments, daycare centers, you know, neighborhoods um, so that you can help help you know our country prevent sexual abuse in communities as well as also know how to address it when it, it when it does happen so that we don't prevent you know we don't cause any more trauma to children um, who have reported this crime because it's very difficult for children to report this crime they're usually under a lot of pressure um, and fear not to report it and so this is this encourages adults to be able to take these um, reports very seriously whereas oftentimes it um, it hasn't been the case in the past so it's a good cause it's a win-win for you as a you know as a fantasy owner um, you get to help the community and you get to help yourself in the same boat so um, once again you can find it at mattwaldmanrsp.com um, is my blog and you can download both of these at mattwaldman.com thanks again